Hi guys, this is Andrew Burgess back with Ruby for Newbies lesson eight. In this lesson, we're going to talk about gems. So what exactly is a gem just before we get started? A gem is like a small library or a plugin for Ruby, or sometimes it's a whole separate program. It's really just a really simple way to distribute functionality. Gems are kept in repositories online, and you can easily download them, include them in your projects, or use them separately. And I think the idea of what a gem is will become more clear as we go along. So let's go ahead and see how exactly we can work with gems. You can use gems for all kinds of things. For example, interfacing with Amazon's S3 service. Um, we'll use a gem in future screencasts. We'll use the Sinatra gem to build quick and easy web applications. If you want to send emails from your code, you could write that from scratch, but why not find a gem that makes it a lot easier to do? How about a web server when you're testing your programs locally? That's what you'll use gems for. Testing, they've got gems for that too. I even use a gem to convert tutorials from Markdown to HTML after I'm finished with them. So the first thing we have to do is install the Ruby Gems library. The Ruby Gems library is the functionality that allows you to download and work with gems. If you're on Ruby 1.9, any branch of or any, any version of Ruby 1.9, you don't have to worry about this because Ruby Gems is built in. If you're on Ruby 1.8, you'll probably have to install it, but it's not too hard. Just head over to rubygems.org, click uh, Install Ruby Gems 1.6.2, which is the latest version, and then you want to download either the tar or the zip archives, and then the instructions right here show you exactly what to do. Just download it, unarchive it, on the terminal, change into that directory, and then run ruby setup rb. That'll run the setup file and get you all set up with gems. As it says here, you might need admin or root privileges, so you might just add sudo to the beginning of that. I should note that if you use the, um, what's it called, the uh, ruby installer for Windows, whoops. Then which you probably did. If you're on Windows, you probably used the Ruby installer, unless you did it from source. Um, you don't have to worry about this either because Ruby Gems is installed. So let's, now that we all have the Ruby Gems library installed, let's talk about putting those gems to work. But first, of course, we have to download gems. So actually, let, let me mention one more thing. You can find out what version, um, if you already have Ruby Gems installed, you can find it just by running gem-v, and you can get the version. As you know, 1.6.2, as we just saw, is the latest version. However, you can run uh, gem update dash dash system, and that will, if you're running on a previous version of Ruby Gems, it'll update it. As you can see, I have the latest version, and so it just aborted that. All right, so installing gems. It's, well, the hard part really is finding the gems you want to install. But most of the time, you can just Google around and um, whatever the functionality you want is, and you'll find what the popular gems are. And there are hundreds upon hundreds of gems out there. So often, there'll be more than one that can do what you want. So find one you like, find one whose uh, API you think works well, or uh, is kind of intuitive, or however you'd like to decide what gems you use. And then um, we'll have to install it. So. Installing a gem is pretty simple. You just run gem, install, and then we're going to put the gem name here on the command line. So, for example, um, I know I already have this gem installed, but if I run the Maruku gem, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, that's just a gem that will convert uh, Markdown to HTML. So I'll just hit enter here. And when you are installing a gem like this, you can see it's already installed the gem. But besides the gem, you're going to get the documentation for the gem as well. So you get more than just the gem. And if there are any other gems that this gem is dependent on, those gems will be installed as well. So you can see um, we already have that gem installed, so it went. So it, I didn't have to install it this time. But it's just that simple to install a gem. Other gems, uh, let's try one more here, although I'm pretty sure I have this one too. The Amazon Web Service S3 gem. Just like that, gem, install, and the name of the gem. And as you can see, looks like, uh, well, I probably had it installed, but I didn't have the latest version. 
And so it just updated me to the latest version of that gem. It's pretty simple. As you can see, it had it required the XML simple gem by the looks of it. And so you can see here two gems were successfully installed. And then we caught and we got the two different types of documentation, RI and RDoc. That's pretty simple, eh? Okay, so now let's talk about using these gems. Now that we have them installed, how do you use them? Well, there are a couple of different ways to use gems. Some gems are standalone Ruby programs that you can run to perform some kind of action. For example, the Rails, Ruby on Rails, is installed as a gem. You'll go gem install rails and it's going to install rails and all the dependencies and then to use rails you're going to use um, rails to generate use the rails gem to generate rails projects so you'll run on the command line and we'll see this later on maybe in f uh, future screencasts you'll run rails new and then the name of your project and it'll create a new folder with that name and then install all the Rails stuff inside of it. Then other times in your project you'll run uh, Rails new controller, Rails new model, that kind of thing and you'll use the Rails gem many times but you're never actually using the Rails gem inside the code. As you can see here the Rails gem has started to install and there are quite a few dependencies. Of course I think I already have uh, some of these installed so it didn't do everything. Um, and it's just doing some updates now. So besides standalone projects, there are gems that you're going to use in your code. For example, this Amazon S3 gem is going to be pretty useless by itself, but inside a project, it can be really helpful. The way to do that is to use, and um, let me just uh, start a new tab here and open IRB. The way to do this, to use gems inside a project, is to require them, first of all. Now, um, and actually, let me just bring up a VM window here to show you, and then we'll do it in the terminal. So the first thing you're going to do, um, the first thing you're going to do is say require. Now, if you're on Ruby 1.8 and Ruby gems didn't come with Ruby, then you're going to have to add, then you're going to have to start by requiring Ruby gems. Now, what does require mean? Well, Ruby doesn't load all the functionality that it comes with by default. That would just be too huge and take too much time to load it all, I guess. So they just load kind of a base of functionality that you're most likely going to use, and if you need more, just require it. You're familiar with doing this in things like PHP with include a requiring. So you start by requiring Ruby gems, and I shouldn't say um, only required for Ruby 1.8. So if you're on Ruby 1.9, you don't have to require Ruby gems. Then, or at the beginning in Ruby gem, in Ruby 1.9, you just require the gem. Now, so for example, we had the Maruku gem, Maruku gem, for converting Markdown to HTML. We had the Amazon S3 gem. Notice this: the Amazon S3 gem was installed with AWS dash S3 and we require with AWS slash S3. There's no um, rule that says the, the name you use to install the gem is the name you use to require the gem. For example, the RSpec gem, which is a testing framework, um, when you install it, you do gem install RSpec, but when you require it, you just use spec. So there's no rule saying you have to have it the same way. So you want to make sure when you're finding the documentation for your gem that you see does it uh, require the same way. And most of the time, if it's just a single word gem, it probably will. But it's always good to check just to make sure. So now that those gems are required, we can use them in our code. So let's go back to the terminal here, and we'll see how this works. So I'm going to require the Maruku gem, and we see true, which means we got it required. And now that we've required it, let's do something. So I'm going to say create a string here, and it's just going to be some markdowns. So we'll say this is a title, um, new line, then we'll say some, new line list, new line items, and I'm actually going to put two new lines over here. So we have the string there, and actually if I do uh, put s string, yeah, you can see how we have the new line showing up in there. Okay, so now let's create a new markdown document, 
maruku.new. We're going to pass it the string. And notice that we have it. Uh, this is kind of the output it gives us as the raw format of the markdown. And then we can just say um, markdown to HTML document. And you can see what we get output here is HTML. And if we went through this, you can see um, there's our H1 with the title. We have an unordered list with our three list items. And of course, you can see how you could use this within um, within a project to take in Markdown and convert it to HTML. And of course, we could have saved this to a file if we wanted to. By default, it just outputs a string, and so we could put that wherever we want, into a file or whatever. In fact, if we do um, puts, you can see we get the HTML right here displayed because um, it has all the new lines right in it. And so that, it's just that simple to use a gem, and of course it's going to be different for whatever gem you use, but that's a simple explanation of using it. You just require the gem, and then you can use it within your code. Okay, there's one more thing I want to talk about, and that is using Bundler. Often you're going to have a lot of gems in a project, and it's not going to be rare that you want to share the project or move it to another computer. A great example of this is when you've got, you're have got you building a web app, you've got it on your computer, and you want to deploy it to a web server. How do you make sure the server has all the gems that you want and all the versions specific to whatever? Enter Bundler. Bundler is a gem itself, and its entire purpose is to make it really easy to install multiple gems. So let's see how we do that. First, of course, um, we, this is finished here. You'd want to do gem install bundler. Once bundler is installed, the way you'll use it is, so let's say we're in a project here. In fact, I'm going to, um, well, as soon as bundler installs here, I'm going to create a new folder. So I have this, okay, so let's um, make a directory, where are we in my home, um, let me ch change to the desktop here. So we're going to um, make a directory, and we're just going to call it some project. Okay, so in here, we're going to create a file named gemfile. Gemfile is a Ruby file that is going to use the bundler syntax to declare what gems we need for this project. So we want to start by telling bundler where we're, going to, where we're getting these Ruby gems. Now, there are multiple places online where you can host gems. Um, the one that is most common is the rubygems.org. So I'm just going to put that in here because uh, source, I'm just going to say uh, rubygems.org. All right, now we just say what gems we need. So for example, we can say gem rails. We can also, as a second parameter, use 3.0.1 or whatever version. Actually, I think the latest version is uh, um, 5. So let's just put that in. Um, gem Roku just uses the gems we're using here. And then... Amazon S3, uh, that was a dash. And then we're going to say require. So what does this mean, this last line here? As we saw up here, um, Rails 3.0.5, that's just telling it which version of the gem to install. This hash, remember, when a hash is the last parameter of a method call and, remember, and realize this gem is just a method call that we're calling the method gem. So this is hash as the last parameter of this method call so we don't have to put the curly braces on it. Remember that we said that the installation name for the Amazon S3 but, uh, gem was not the same as the require name. Now we can use Bundler both to install the gems we want and to require the gems that we want to use. If we just want to require these all or you can get into more specific combinations where you have sets of gems that you require depending on, for example, your environment, whether you're doing it locally or on the server or whatever. Um, and we're not going to get into that today, but uh, I'll point you to a resource for that in a minute. But just basic use of Bundler is so we list these gems here. And if we were going to require these gems using Bundler, Bundler would need to know that this is not the name we want to require the gem by. This is the name we want to require the gem by. So that's it. We've got this uh, bundle here. And now 
inside this project folder, let's say we've moved this over to the server, we're just going to run bundle install. And as you can see, it's installing these gems. So it's starting by going out to rubygems.org to see if it can find the gems. Hopefully all these gems are on that server. I'm not exactly sure of that, but I think there's a pretty good chance that they are. And there you go. As you can see, your bundle is complete, and it was installed into this directory. And so now we can see that all of our gems have been installed. Now, f assuming, uh, let's just create another file here. As I mentioned earlier, we can use Bundler to require the gems as well. So we can do this just by saying require uh, bundler.setup. And remember, if you're on Ruby 1.8, to require Ruby gems first. And then we just say bundler.require default. It's that simple. And that will just require all the default gems. And don't worry about what it means by default right now because you can have specific sets of gems, as I mentioned. By default, any gems are just listed in the kind of the root here. And it'll install all those gems. I'm sorry, it'll require all those gems. So this would be equivalent to doing require, well, it wouldn't require Rails, but require Maruku and require AWS slash S3. And that is using gems. It's, it's exactly that simple. So that has been using gems. We've discussed installing the Ruby Gems library if you need to, installing gems themselves, and then how to use them. Today's Ruby resource is going to be the Bundler homepage. You can go to gembundler.com. There's a lot more you can that you can do with Bundler that we haven't discussed in this tutorial. A lot of it gets a lot more advanced, and if once you learn some Rails, you'll find out that Bundler is really handy for installing, um, for example, having test suites installed on your local computer and then having you know different things you may be using one server to test on your local computer and a different server program to um, run your code on the actual production server things like that bundler makes it really easy to keep all that settled to keep all that really clear and um, keeps it all nice and easy well that's been ruby for newbies lesson eight thanks so much for watching